So uh, I didn't really have, um, I don't really have any kind of course for this workshop. It just kind of came about that um, sometimes I question what I do in a setup. And if I'm either doing too much for not enough money, or if I should be doing less for the same amount of money. So I started talking to a few people and <coughs> compiling information from different, uh, you know, like Guitar Center and Sweetwater and stuff to just kind of compare. And we're just kind of curious, um, looking over those lists, you know, what are you guys doing? What are you charging? And, and uh, uh, how, you know, how, what's your customer base? Is, is that enough for them? And are, you know, do they want more out of setup or less out of setup? And then they complain or any of that kind of stuff. So. Who has a repair shop or work in a repair shop now? And then, uh, who are some folks just getting into it? Just getting into it? Do you have a cut? Have you, have you opened for business? Are you dealing with customers at all yet? Or? Um, when I do have a business, I'm technically <coughs> not officially open, I'm not advertising. Just taking on small like people at work, and then the network's slowly growing, so just slowly trying to build up, but nothing steady yet. Do you have a, a little like set deal you do for all your setups and whatnot? Um, I guess so, yeah. Just where you start on that? Um, price wise or? Yeah. 65 for setup. Right. That's where, that's where I'm at. Yeah. You know, 65, 75 for what is listed in um, my sheet in there. And, um, Sometimes I can easily go down a rabbit hole with that, you know? It's like, depending on the instrument, um, uh, it, it, whether the customer's into it or not, um, you know, it, it's uh, it can easily get out of control really quick on that kind of stuff. So, um, I've got much, many, many more. But with, uh, and then Evan, he's got his even streamlined even further to where, you probably, I don't know, how long does it take you to do your episode? Oh, I don't know. Uh, it really depends on whether it needs any work or not. But if it doesn't need any work, uh, you know, I've got it down to half an hour. 30 minutes. That's, that's everything, not so much money. Yeah. It's just, if you do it so much, you just get fast at it. Are you guys doing fret work as part of the setup? No. So, no. No. Okay. no. Okay. Yeah, it's an addition. So anything, um, like, with, with, what I'm doing in my shop. Um, oops, sorry, man. I was shocked with that. <laughs> I'll go over the in, the instrument, do a total evaluation of it. You know, a lot of times it's like I feel like that's like um, when you go to rent a car. You know, and you go over the you go outside with the guy, and you well not you because you won't drive, but uh, you go <laughs> you go. This is no joke. One time we came back from a Northwood seminar. I see you all. <laughs> we came back from the Northwood Seminar, and I, I lived, at that time I lived about three blocks from the place where I rented the car, and I asked Evan if he would drive my car, follow me to the rental place to drop off the rental car, he just would not do it. Yeah, I'll drive with everybody in that town. <laughs> no limitations. Yeah, he wouldn't no drive that. <laughs> um, so I often, you know, it's a, a lot of times the stuff I do come in, through the mail, or, or but if it's a local customer, and I'll go over the instrument with the customer, and make note of any kind of damage, um, check the condition of the hardware and stuff to make sure it's not like either. You know, some people have that acidic sweat that will just eat metal parts and corrode everything and kill everything, or just you know, packed with dirt or whatever. Um, uh, check the electronic components for function. Uh, check the strings. You know, if it's a totally trash set of strings. Um, you know, or if they're you know showing sign of stress or whatever, I'll get rid of them. But if they're relatively new or whatever, I'll do a lot of the setup with those original strings on. Um, I often ask customers to include, you know, depending on what type of strings or whether or not I stock them, or, not, um, or if they just don't want to pay for them, ask them to include two sets of strings. So one, if I have to chain them right off the bat, I can. If not, whatever. Uh, and then it starts coming down to the playability as aspect. Um, I'll, I'll, before really I get too far into it, I'll clean and lubricate the truss rod, um, make sure that it's functioning properly, and then once I, you know, get it ready to go, I'll adjust the neck, and then play it. Um, it's one thing, you know, I, I, uh, I'm not, I don't, I'm not 
uh, bagging on anybody that doesn't play guitar, but if you're a guitar repair person or if you're getting into this field, um, you really should know at least a few chords so you can bang out. Larry touched on this earlier. It's like it's really important to be able to um, relate to your customers on, on what they're looking for. And, uh, and I don't know, Dan probably remembers this, but you know, Don McGrossy didn't really play when he was building, when he first really got into building those mandolins. And he later in life kind of had to teach himself to, um, you know, get, take lessons and learn uh, how to play the mandolin so he could better relate to his customers. And man, that was painful. He'd come to these events and like hop in on a jam session and he was just learning how to play. And he was just like, oh man, Don, go back to your room and practice a little bit. <laughs> like pretty rough. But, so it, it, it might be rough going at first, but it's really in your best interest to learn how to play the guitar, um, even if it's just a cowboy chord, so you can at least get a feel for it and relate to your customer better um, as far as what they're doing. Um, after, you know, part of, the, part of inspecting it is, is, you know, paying attention to the frets, uh, loose frets, tall frets, proud frets, um, that all kind of falls in to the equation. It's not something that is included in the, in a general setup, it's, that'll take it a different direction. So if you have something uh, that has fret issues, um, you, you got to get a hold of your customer and discuss that and figure out where you can go with that. Uh, more and more, we're seeing um, tools being developed that are designed to be used without having to take the strings off. And uh, if you have those tools, like Evan will do that if he's got just like a little proud fret or something. Um, he'll get in with like a little angle, with a little aluminum angle bar and, and level that out. Uh, something that we just started carrying, which was designed by our own <coughs> buddy Matt Brooker. Um, uh, it's just like uh, fret press calls for jaws and the arbor press and all that kind of stuff that work around the strings. But sometimes a, a fret just needs a little, a little squeeze to uh, get back into place, and then it'll stay. You know, it'll stay down there. It's, it's seated, but um, you not always. But a lot of times, what's that? You carry that too, Matt? These? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we just now, they're maybe a month old in the catalog. Cool. Um, and we have them in all, we just added five more sizes of radius calls. So the whole set now is like 15 or six, 15, 15 pieces? Yeah, something like that. So those are under the radius calls in the catalog. Maybe. They're called notched radius, they're not called yeah, notched yeah, radius calls. Yeah, um, and then we have these available in all 15 sizes cool. as well. Uh, Did you bring same, what's we are um, some down at the, at the booth, yeah. Yeah, we didn't bring all of them, but we do have we do have some gauges of them. Yeah, we do have all the regular press calls down there. But that's just kind of a handy little little thing that we get that we uh, you know that is, enables you to move on through the uh, setup without a big whoop to do to have to talk to the customer about if you can just squeeze a fret back in there. Um, radius. Uh, it's always important to make sure that the radius matches the fingerboard if it's just a, a regular uh, cylinder. Um, of course, the compound radius would be different than the end of the fretboard. It would be a little, a little flatter as you go out. Um, uh, adjust the action at the bridge. Um, and then that's most of the mechanical part of it. I'll go uh, through the electronics, check all the solder joints, make, their, make sure they're clean and pretty, nice looking, not been messed with or whatever, or if they have been, you know, you might touch a soldering iron to clean them up. Can I ask uh, a question before you get too far away? Yeah, any questions, feel free to ask as uh, many summer, questions. Summer, winter, front kind of issues. Uh -huh. Do you, you know, in the winter, the wood shrunk up a little bit, the frets are a little bit proud, do you whisk them off? Or? Um, it depends on how bad they are. Like, there's sometimes it, where when they're hanging off really bad, and then it, you know the winter it's super dry and stuff. Um, if you go and you knock off the sharp edges of those, and then the neck gets rehumidified, a lot of times the frets will be sitting in, you know, like a thirty second or a sixty fourth of an inch on the side and stuff. I try to prevent that if possible. Um, we'll try to humidify and, and see if how much of a problem that solves. If if any, sometimes it doesn't make a difference at all. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean that's definitely something. <coughs> that you would want to take care of one way or another. If it's real extreme, I, I try not to just go knocking them off like 
just the knee-jerk reaction is like, oh, I'm going to take these off. But sometimes the end result is a little funky looking. It might be perfectly functional, but I just don't like the look of them sitting in like that. It's, it looks like the cat fret wire is too short or whatever. So oftentimes we'll see if humidity helps to solve that problem. And, we'll, and you know, again, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. It depends on the part, the type of finish on it, and whatnot. That's definitely something that would take care of there. And then that would also be, uh, that wouldn't fall into the normal price because you know, you're plowing those off and then you got to kind of redress the edges, the edges to make them all nice and pretty. So that would be an additional charge there. Um, and at that, and then I also start messing with the pickups around this time. Um, and you know, I have a ballpark. Uh, height that I'd, I'll go for, like, you know, a starting point of, you know, 16th or 330 seconds or whatever, depending on the pickup, but a lot of times it comes down to the ear, and then also the player, you know, sometimes a guy will play really light, and you can get the pickups fairly close to the strings without any interference, you get a nice balance between the two, but if he's, like, punching the thing or hammering it pretty hard, which I tend to do, I, I'm a pretty hard strummer. Um, I adjust them out of the way a little bit so the strings don't rattle and yeah, that happens. Uh, but a lot of it is ear, you know. I, I sit down and play the guitar, get familiar with the guitar, and listen to the balance between the pickups and, and figure out the best setting for that. Um, and it's a good, also, I think that's the way you kind of control the volume and the dynamics of the particular pickup is with the height. So there's a lot to be said about that um, with an electric instrument. Uh, it's worth the time to put into it. Sometimes, I mean, I love to play, which is why I got into this to begin with, because I, I, I don't consider myself a particularly good guitar player. I just love the sound of it. So I'm still at 50 years old. I'm staying out at the bars until three in the morning playing my guitar because I just like to hear the stuff. And so, uh, um, it's always fun to find the sweet spot on a pickup, and, and especially the pickup and amp combination. So. I just bought a sweet Fender uh, Super 6, 120 watts through 6 tens. And I'm a short guy, and that's a tall amp. And that top two tens is like right there, so you can get this like beautiful <laughs> feedback on those things. It's uh, really, really nice. So that's, uh, that's what I do it for is the sound. You know? so it's, all, it's all a lot of fun. Um, then once I'm done with that and I'm happy with it, I'll take the strings off. I'll clean uh, the fingerboard if, um, you know, I know a lot of shops, I think I saw a sign at Gary's one time, it's like every guitar must be thoroughly cleaned or something before ah. it goes back in the case. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some of my customers don't want that, you know, it's I like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I never saw that sign. <laughs> it's like, uh, it's, you know, some people do like, we really enjoy, open it up their case after a setup and they're like, wow, this thing looks brand new. You know, like, wow, you really did a great job. This thing looks like it did when I got it, you know, or whatever. Um, but there's that also that group of guys, and I'd probably fall into that. That's where uh, where um, you, you start cleaning the crud off their guitars and they're just like, the mojo, man. I took off all the mojo. And I, you know, I can, I can relate to that. So um, it really, cleaning it up, um, depends on, uh, on whether or not the customer wants it or not. And I usually don't charge much more than that for that, or any more than that in, in the original setup, unless it's something totally disgusting, like Dan worked on it. I shouldn't say disgusting, just totally gobbed up. Dan worked on a Les Paul, it's probably been 10 years ago. Remember that one that came from down south and it was just caked shut? I wouldn't work on it until I cleaned it. <laughs> yeah. Even gloves on it. <clears throat> That thing was super, you know, and that was a job in itself. It was just getting that guitar cleaned up and really, you know, to work on it. So that all depends. Um, and then at this point, I'll put a fresh set of strings on it. Um, double check the truss rod adjustment. Make sure that it didn't change with the other set of strings or drift. If you can, you know, this this doesn't. You know, a lot of a lot of people like to just get something on their bench and uh, uh, kick it out the door you know, the same day or whatever, or at least have it done the same day, put it back in the case and not have to think about it. If at all possible for me, I'd like to, and this is, a lot of this stuff is stuff I want to do. 
if you have the opportunity to make the trust fund adjustment, let it sit for a day or two, and then just put your eyes back on it. For a few months. For a few months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It um, quite <laughs> Uh, it's it's like if you have a, an opportunity just to look at it again and make sure that it didn't drift because especially if it's a neck that has been like in relief for a while and you got to put a little bit of wrench on it in order to, to straighten it out uh, sometimes it's going to want to continue into the back of just a little bit so that's all stuff that um, um, you got to take into consideration uh, so check the chest what's that question on that Sure. Is there a formula you use for relief? Um, like any kind of standard? Well, we kind of like we kind of like necks as straight as possible, um, and I would I would even say dead flat um, if you can get away with it. And some players can't. You can't do that with. Um, but there are you know if you I find there's a lot of players that can do that. So. Dead flat, or maybe just a you know a couple thousands here or there, or whatever. But overall, the tone of a straight of a dead flat neck, you know, with the tension of the truss rod, it just has a ring to it. Um, feel free to stir along on this one. It's relatively straight right now, and uh, just a teeny bit of relief, and um, just the sound of it, it just rings so much better than. Um, an instrument that uh, has got a you know considerable amount of relief in it. So it's it's something that we we uh, you're, you're still doing that. You're still going for a, a straight neck. I've always that's all I like. And you is that what you're down for? Oh, yeah, feeling. for sure. Yeah. As soon as you're losing yeah, the trust, yeah, the, 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 the tone is gone. <clears throat> yeah. So more often than not, unless it, unless the customer's playing style seriously just can't support it. Um, we'll go for uh, uh, you know what I mean. You yeah, know what no, I, mean. I put yeah. I like straight neck, but I play too hard when I'm right. playing, so I believe it a little bit. Yeah, yeah, and, and and you know it depends on the guitar. My jazz master, I have a little bit of relief because the way that thing when I when I'm laying on that thing, it sounds like a trash can lid or something. You know, so, <laughs> so like I got to put a little bit of relief on it when it's got a straight neck. But so that's kind of where we go with that. There's no set formula because it is by far a case to case situation. But if, if we can get away with it, we'd like to, we'd like to do a straight man. Um, then I'll move on to intonation and uh, check that. It's never really a big deal. Um, it's imperfect as, you know, it's an imperfect science as it is, so you've generally got a little bit of room to, to monkey with there. Um, except for that guy that I dealt with on the phone today. <laughs> we had to come out, customer positioned his bridge in the wrong location. And, and uh, um, it's on a guitar that he's <coughs> designing for General Motors Corporation. <laughs> and uh, he, the bridge came, he put the bridge on in the wrong location, and of course it's Stuart McDonald's fault. But we're trying to work through him on that. It's, uh, it's working out. It's working out. I was, had a pleasant conversation. <laughs> he's just down the road. Um, and so I asked him, can I come to the shop? And he, oh, no. <laughs> top secret. He's like, this is top secret. You don't really want to talk really? about it. Oh yeah, yeah. He's, okay. like, this is, he's a he's a nice guy. He's yeah. a, he's, a nice he's guy. very nice. It just the um, problem arose for me. Yeah, it was just an issue. But so uh, <coughs> checking the intonation, make sure it's playing in tune all over the neck. You know, of course, it's something that I didn't measure or mention when you're checking the frets for playability. Um, every note, every fret, every string up and down the neck, just to make sure there's not something that you don't see. Um, straight edges, fret rockers, that kind of stuff. These happen to be my favorite little straight edges for checking fret height. Um, I use those quite a bit. Uh, again, you know, I talked about this little guy for squeezing them frets if they're loose. Sometimes if you have to take a little bit off the top there, we've worked on this. I'll uh, guess we'll pass them around and take a look at them. But we kind of took our fret rocker idea and doubled the thickness of it and then put in diamond abrasives in the middle there so you can span the proud fret and uh, knock it down with the strings on if you need to. I hope you know if it's not a huge ordeal, you can get you can get in there and, and level the frets with that guy just to knock her down. So play every fret, every position, every string, uh, just to make sure that you don't have something weird going on because sometimes things move. Um, 
Do you lose straightness on that device, or only if you wear the diamond out? Do you lose straightness on that device? Um, you rock it with the bracelet in the center. Uh, it's, it's, it is possible to lose a minute amount. Um, so like if you, it's not something that you would be able to notice playability wise, but if you stuck a straight edge on it and you held it up to the window or whatever, you would notice there's, you, you can see, it's not necessarily a gap, but you can see light through that spot. So yeah, that is uh, something that we've been contending with, but we feel that the benefit of the tool outweighs that weird little aspect of it, because it's not meant to be used as a straight edge. The human eye can see a millionth of an inch with it in a black box with a light behind it. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So, which, and so a thousandth is all, it, it's hard to <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so what Dan's saying is... You can be looking at a gap that means nothing. Absolutely, you couldn't you couldn't fit anything through it, but you can totally see it. So it's it's a thing, you know. It's it's definitely a, your eyes can play tricks on you. So that was a big what you're mentioning, like uh, was a a little bit of a, a issue for me. Like, well, we can't send this out into the world if there's just the iota of, <laughs> the iota. Of, <laughs> of a perception that that tool is not straight. There's always one in the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> so that if there's just you know one iota of 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 you know something that puts doubt in someone's mind at all, you know like oh geez this must not be straight. I just spent blah 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 on it or whatever. Well, mm -hmm. I just I I worry about that quite a bit and um, to the point where. I don't think Dan was involved at that point, but I totally pissed off the other guys on the R&D team because I was just like, we, you know, we can't put this out in the market, you know, because of this just perception that it might not be straight. And uh, those guys, uh, the older, more experienced fellows, smacked me down pretty good on that one, and, and I finally agreed with them on that. You, know, you, so. you, you mean the older one? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's uh, we're pretty excited about that. It's just a neat little, a neat little thing that. that um, we have coming out. It'll probably be out in August. Not exactly sure what it's going to be called, but no, it's cool. I, I, I mean, yeah, we sent Evan a prototype. When we yeah, got and it. it's uh, I like I'm very very slow to use new tools because I use my own stuff. So I if, if at all yeah if at all. So I put it you know because it looks like my fret rocker. I put it on the pen board next to my fret rocker and it, and it looked good. And it sat there for a really long time. And, um, <laughs> then, then, I, um, then I had this Elric five-string bass, uh, super critical customer, uh, who's always like nuts about frets. And uh, this bass in particular had very, very low frets. And I said to myself, I'm going to, and it had multiple spots where there were just inconsistencies in the fret. And I said to myself, this is not my base, let me try this thing. And uh, <laughs> so, so, um, <laughs> um, so what I did was I, because I, I didn't want to hog off all the material just to get all of these uh, spots that were not level. So I, um, just with a little magic marker, just marked off all the spots and then I started using this and this thing was actually super, super cool. And then I would check it with the fret rocker afterwards with a little light behind and see that I was, well, and I, I love it. It was great. It's cool. So, good to hear. Everybody see these? Everybody, everybody seen that one? It's seen. Yeah. So that's a cool little dealio that we have coming up. Now, um, would you uh, what do you think about when you find, let's say you find the high fret, you take care of one fret, right, and then <laughs> you realize, oh man, there's there's five. I'd like to take care of them. That's when you make the phone call. Will you do one? And you, if like, or if you play the whole all the notes, and you, right? Like that's where I, like you were saying, you kind of run into this. You know, what do I do? Do I take care of it on the bench? Do I call? Wait for a return yeah. call? Do something else? That might be when the whole it's quicker to do it and talk about it. So yeah, in, in some cases. Yeah. So if it's if it's just one fret and it's not a huge ordeal, you know, I don't have to pull it. I just have to reseed it or I have to level it and just recrown it for yeah. a minute. I won't really. It's simply like Tim says. It's better just not to have that conversation. But just there is a point where yeah. if you do that one fret and then that one fret reveals 
or, or you know, there's other issues, but if that one prep reveals some other problems or whatever, um, that's when it's time to call the guy. And, uh, you know, a lot of times budget, uh, yeah. you know, Paul and I work for some of the big slackers in the world. And, uh, Hurt bags. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right. And, uh, uh, but, you know, back to the Sweetwater thing, this is one thing that is really awesome about Sweetwater, <laughs> is they hired, it's like the home for wayward guitar freaks, you know, it's like so many of those guys that I knew that worked there, or that are working there, if they weren't working at Sweetwater, they'd be working at McDonald's, I mean, there's just no two ways about it, so. And so a lot of times the budget does come into play with, with the kind of the clientele that, you know, that we have in Athens. Athens is. When the students are gone, it's like, what, 14,000 people or something like that? It's a dinky little place, you know, so there's not a lot of, it's not like, um, you know, L.A. or Boston or something where you got a bunch of folks coming up the street. So that, that's, that's, a, that's always kind of an issue, so. In that case, yeah. I love to barter. Yeah, totally. You've seen my Instagram page. I got yeah, all sorts. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of that stuff I get is, is from bartering. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know. I mean, sometimes it's just that, you know, maybe it's the first time somebody's come in and like, hey man, there were a couple of high frets, yeah. level them out, here you go. Yep. Then some, you get further good. in, and you know, I just don't want to spend too much time when we are talking about the $65 setup. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And then a lot of times, if it's, if it's, you know, I mean, sometimes, of course, all of us are, are you know, strive for some level of perfection or just to get it out there. Um, you know, sometimes it'll be something on a customer's guitar and it'll be a fret issue. It might just be a little slight rattle or a slight whine somewhere here or there. And it's not bad enough to where the guitar is not playable. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll just mention to them when they pick the guitar up, like, possible <coughs> fret issues down the road. You know, it's starting to show signs of wear and you can Things, this thing can benefit from a fret level and dress up next time or whatever. Um, you know, that, that way they don't feel like I'm trying to, to grab by the tail and say, you know, once you get it in the door, like I, I know repairmen um, that, you know, just getting into the door is like, yeah, you, you got to do this or you got to do that. And then they, that's like, they start upselling and stuff. Yeah. I, I try not to do that unless, like, again, it depends on the customer. If, I'm, if it's one of my customers that doesn't, you know, is, is a working musician or whatever, I try to. To reason with them or try to be reasonable with them. Um, sometimes to a fault, like if someone, like you know, Scotty's getting ready to go out on tour with Skeleton, which is something like that. I, I feel bad taking money from them because they're, you know, yeah. you know, their tour's going to be tight yeah. anyway, and they're going to be going out on the road. So pay me when you get back. You know, Working musician, quote unquote, the unemployed. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, there's a million jokes on that. Yeah. Yeah. It was all it for a while. Yeah. So um, it's all it's all it all ties in. Um, but after I check the playability that one last time, make sure that it's where I'd like it to be. Um, I don't always think I'm right. You know, again, it's good to if you can, um, if it's possible to com communicate with the customer. If you can hear how they play, you know, um, it can really the, the style that they play can really determine how you're going to set the game. So, uh, so communicate with them as much as you can. And then, once that's done, um, whether I'm cleaning it or not, I just pack the guitar up, call the customer, and tell them it's ready, and uh, and then I charge them, you know, sixty-five to seventy-five dollars, and uh, um, that's just the, uh, you know, that's where I'm at. And so, I guess my question to you guys is: Is that too much, or is that too little? And for all the stuff I just read out to you, would you guys be charging more? Or? Well, about, yeah, that's about right. That's about average. It depends that's on what your bench rate is. I mean, are you prorating to the minute for the setup, or are you just doing the setup? I mean, if you're prorating to the minute, which is what I do, uh -huh. well, it could be a $75 setup, or it could be an $85 setup, or it could be a $35 setup. I mean, you know, I'm not doing I'm not doing flat rates. So if a guy comes in and that's $35, well, it's $37.50 with tax. See it. So that's you. You do it strictly by the, the yep. time invested. Yep. How does that work with your customers? Just like, well, it's a spin of the roulette wheel. It could be 35 or No, be it's, it's, it's objective. It's absolutely objective because they're getting exactly what they paid for. I, no, I understand that, but... Do they accept it? Like, are they skeptical they at all? They accept it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it depends on how, how well you know your customer. Yeah. You know, if you, if you have a relationship with the person, of course they'll accept it. But if you if you don't really essentially have a relationship with the person, you have to form a bond with them so that they will trust you. Right. So that you can get what you should get for the services that you perform. And I encourage everyone uh, in this room to go to their local BMW dealer, find out what their mechanics charge an hour, and charge that same rate. That's a good. That's a. That's a good. That's an interesting aspect there. So do you do you explain to a, a, a new guy that's walking in that's never done business sure, before? Sure, I'll spend a half hour talking to him and not charge him for the half hour. <laughs> right, and then you say this setup might cost you thirty-five bucks, but it might cost you seventy-five. No, no, no. I'll tell him before they go that. It, so you evaluate this from a yeah, spot. Yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. And yep. you know, if it's a hundred and twenty twenty dollars setup, well, uh, that that's a hundred and twenty dollars setup. Right. You know, if you have to move somebody's nut or something like that. Sure. Or, or know, it's a Floyd Rose or whatever. Yeah, I'm going to say, I, I will charge more for a Floyd Rose yeah. than, than an electric 12 strip. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Rick and Mac as well? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Twice yeah. yeah, that's like a, a, a premium. Or what, are they, what, do you, what did you call that? What do you call the, like the Floyd Rose? Like a, oh, like a uh, specialty, I think is what Specialty bridge of some sort. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. bulk of my experience. Um, do you have, have anyone sign something like, the, you know, I'm entering an agreement that I'm going to pay this much per, before you, they drop off the guitar, do you have like a document that you sign for everything? No. You, know, you just word of mouth? No, we, we, we do. We make, <clears throat> well, I mean, I'm doing, I, it's, a, it's essentially a boutique service. I'm not, I'm not really, it's, my, my business is a viable business, but it's, uh, it's boutique. It's not straight retail. I don't get people. I don't advertise. Uh, it's all it's all word of mouth. It's all right. referral. So if right. people don't know me. They don't know me. That's just fine. That just, I tell them, oh, you don't know me. You're out of the loop. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Yeah. Appreciate that. I like the BMW thing. Yeah. No. I'm yeah. not telling you, man. Go to, go to the local mechanics. See what they get paid. You work on their car or guitar. Well, it, <laughs> same, same if, money. If they have a, if, if they have nineteen sixty three Commodore. <laughs> yeah. So the, what the shops charging and what they're paying, what the mechanics actually making is. Oh no, I'm not talking about that. <laughs> You're talking about what the shop is charging. Yep. One hundred twenty five an hour, yep. probably at least. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I don't actually charge more for 12 string or Floyd Rose. I look at it more like healthcare, where I do want to cover pre existing conditions. To me, like it all evens out because of the jobs that take much shorter. And, you know, I'm just looking at it long game where, okay, I spent 10 extra minutes on this guitar. The next guitar is shorter than the guitar that's after that. So for me, it's just. The second step in the case, I forgot that I did it anyway, so that's it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, that's it's like kind of how I've taken flat rate setups, at least a guitar center from that perspective. You know, I could say, oh, this guitar didn't need this, so I can subtract, I don't know, $10 from the flat fee. But, you know, on this other guitar, I might hook the dude up with like another, you know, it maybe needs a little bit extra than I would do for the setup, I'll just do it for him. And yeah. it, like, it balances out enough to me that I don't have to fight with the pricing and you tell a guy, like, oh, yeah, well, that's actually going to cost me 10 more bucks than I said. And, you that's know, a I've, straight retail concept, though. The flat it, yeah, rate thing yeah. is a straight retail concept. And that's and that's more my background is. So that's, that's, yeah, that's you know, okay. I and mean, that's just a different yeah, yeah, business absolutely. model. Exactly. Yeah, totally. This is like that conversation, so we can all, you know, I would have never thought to charge hourly. I would have just thought that would be a huge headache, but it's mm -hmm. good to know that it will work. Prorated. Get yourself yeah. a stopwatch. Where are you located? New Jersey. Yeah, right across the George Washington Bridge. Gotcha. <clears throat> yeah, so it's a high density population area. And I mean, you know, it's a, I'm getting referrals, essentially, and the, and the work needs to be done. They know it's there, there because they know it needs to be done. It's not a guessing game. And, uh, you know, sometimes you wind up rolling over on a job, in other words, you know, eating part of it, uh, yep. because it's rational to do so. But that's, you know, that's the other end of the game, is knowing your customer, having a relationship with them, you know, trying to form a bond that, right. that benefits all, both parties. But essentially, I think that the most rational way to do the business is to prorate the business. Cool. Do you guys feel that, um, I, you know, I have my own opinion about this, but do you guys feel that, you know, um, uh, for example, a guy like Paul, who's really only been doing this for a few years, do you think experience comes into the price of the 
that they charge? I don't like, charge them more for knowing what I'm doing, but it means it means that they get the job done faster in uh -huh. a lot of cases, and so they're paying less, in fact. Right, because of the prorated. Yeah. Do you, know, you guys feel that? Do you feel that experience has should have a weight in the price? Do you, know, you feel uh, you should get the you personally should get the same amount of money that Dan Erlewine gets for a setup just because you're doing the same routine? Objectively, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But I think there is there is a certain level to what the market will bear. Uh -huh. Like you know when bringing Guitar Center back into it, the the local price for a setup in my area was sixty five seventy five bucks. Right. Larry can attest to that for sure. Right. Guitar Center went in and fifty bucks. So right. Across the right. Across the yeah. yeah. Not speaking to the quality of what you're going to sure. get, That's but if someone calls you up on the phone and says, "What are you charging for a setup?" and you know you say seventy-five, and guitar center says fifty, probably going to somebody, say, yeah, right. somebody might not know right. the difference. They're like, "Well, yeah. this is safe." I'd rather, price. I'd rather get the job, and because to me, a setup is a, it's a customer building procedure, uh -huh. right? Sure. That's, yeah. You know, partially, it's also a bread and butter job, but right, it gets the guy in the door, and they trust you, and then. You charge what you gotta charge when they need a nut or when they need a pickup install or fretwork or whatever. Right. What about location? Do you think that location should have anything to do with the I think it does, yeah. Like sure. how so? So like when I set my price, I went out and I, I looked at other people in the area and what they were doing, and I tried to I tried to be kind of right in there, you know? Because if everybody else is charging fifty, you're charging sixty five. Sure. So I think location does matter. And in some cases, uh Bigger cities and stuff like that, you have overhead and all that kind of stuff that yeah, you guys more consider. Money, you got to pay taxes, you got to pay insurance, you got to buy insurance for your business. You know? Right. So it's so all factored in. Got to humidity control the environment. Yeah. Cost yeah. money. Yeah. You know, got to alarm it. You no? Know? All that good stuff. It's all cost oh, money. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know why I feel I need to be alarmed or, or, or rigged or armed to the gills with alarm system stuff, but I yeah. definitely am. It's because I know you're dressed. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, definitely one of those things. Fortunately, you probably have to take a car to get there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I'm sorry. Wait <laughs> <laughs> right here. Right here. Right here. Right here. Right here. Right here. Yeah. I have a long-winded question for you about the, the idea of too little, too much. I come at it from a, a different angle. I'm a manufacturer. And so I'm at the, the idea of, like, you know, I'm going to get them out the door. Yeah. And so I constantly face that battle of too little versus too much setup. And I'm wondering, from, from your guys' perspective as a tech, you, you know, what are you seeing as the the items that manufacturers are not looking at? What what are manufacturers missing? When when and this is counterintuitive because I'm saying oh, I'm going to take some money out of your pocket and fix it, right? You know, like, but w what are you seeing that makers are not doing on their guitars that should they should be doing as far as setup stuff yeah. goes? Um, Setups, pickup heights, bridge heights, anything. What do you? All of the above, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see, uh, yeah, hands yeah, nut work, yeah, right. not at, not necessarily heinous, but it's like a lot of time you see nut work that uh, needs to be brought down. Right. Um, and that's one of the you know I talked about the whatever the sixty point plan that Sweetwater does or whatever. Um, that's one of the things that they do, and I, you know. Um, I, I asked, and I didn't really get an answer because the guy didn't know. But I asked if, if, because I, I see it on a lot of new guitars where the nut, the string action of the nut is just too high, and um, Sweetwater has an amazing buying power. I mean, those guys are, are you have uh, nine or ten guys in the repair department, and then forty some folks in the evaluation and setup department that are each doing sixty guitars a day. Um, 60? At least, wow. yeah. Some of them are doing more. Some of them are doing like 80, 90 guitars a day. They go through this this routine. It's like... They do a pretty good job, too. They don't do a bad job. Yeah. And, and I, I asked the head of the operations, the guitar operations, if uh, um, they have a quota. And he was like, oh, no, no, no. We want these guys to be able to do that. But the employees told me that they do have a quota. <laughs> they, they definitely do have a quota that they need to you know, hit every day. And it's right around the 60 mark. But they ship 425, 450 guitars a day. Um, so, yeah, it is, it's an amazing thing. And so I wondered, what I was getting at with this long-winded thing, was I wondered if they requested 
that to the manufacturers to start? Because I noticed the nut height just seems to be, wasn't always that case, um, but it just seems to be lately, and I'm wondering if that's a Sweetwater thing, like make them a little high so we can knock them down. I would rather see a nut come in high. Sure. Oh, high sure. With all the, on a Gibson, they're often low. Yeah. And gotcha. you immediately go to the, however much money and time it takes to get the nut out and make a new nut. Yeah. And I think then they're the now says, they used to be high. Yeah. yeah. Well, why did this happen? Or how do I get money back? Right. Whatever. Um, come like, to my talk on Saturday. And yeah. Um, <laughs> you, then you, you're in the position of representing something that you have no, no part of at all. Right. Um, so I'd much rather see a squire with a high nut than yeah. you know, a low Gibson. Right. But right. if there was some consistency, that would be incredible. Yeah. <laughs> They've gotten a lot better. I mean, now that they're doing nuts on the pluck and stuff like that, um, like I can remember one of the first few years I was working at Dan's. I mean, one of the things we did was Brandon Gibson's right out of the box, knock the nut out, and either level aggressive frets or nine times out of ten just pull them all out and refret the whole guitar. You know, oh, just like I used, to, I used to work for those guys briefly in artist relations, and my boss would get a guitar for an artist, and they'd bring it to my shop, and we'd refret it that day. Right. Yeah. And so it was. It Especially was. Especially the acoustics. Some of these were drop shipped from the point of purchase, you know, like Guitar Center or wherever they came from. They would go yeah. straight to Dan's shop from there. And and we, I called it the business. We give it the business, you know, to <laughs> really get it going. And, and they've gotten much better, but I, we saw all sorts of weird stuff. Bridges put on crooked. And I think they're probably doing great now, actually. They went through a period. They had, they, there was production on the problem. They had, they, yeah. they had management asking for irrational production numbers. And we had a, a Les Paul Classic in, in Dan's shop at one point that had a, you know, AVR1 on it. And they, we couldn't figure out what was going on. Everything was just out of whack. And, and uh, it, they put the bridge in the wrong location, and then they smacked the bottom of it with a hammer, so the poles were bent, the posts were bent <laughs> sideways. Gotta make the production numbers, buddy. Yeah, it was a, that was an interesting, that yeah, was a interesting shop. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, just and in your, uh, in your, you know, your average $65 setup that you're doing, how much time are you spending on adjusting the, the pickups in electric? Are you like are you spending uh -huh. much adjusting the heights of pole pieces or do you charge different for that? Probably more than anything else. Really? Um, you know it's like uh, as long as there's everything's you know provided that it's just you know everything's going as planned. Um, but I'll, I'll get into the pickups. I'll adjust you know on that. There I haven't I don't think I've done it on this one. Could yet. I interrupt that and have you ask that question again? Sure. <laughs> you can get on video. Let's get a little video of that. It's a good question. <laughs> Take it back to Stu now. <laughs> so I'll on. tell you when. <laughs> you don't get nervous. Show time. So on your average guitar uh, that comes in for you know a, a regular setup, how much time are you devoting to adjusting the pickups and the the pole heights? Well, again, my um, the, what draws me to the guitar is the sound of it. So I'll I'll often spend you know just as much time messing with pickup height and adjusting pull pieces and stuff like that as I do uh, the rest of the setup. You know, um, which doesn't really line, uh, align with making you know whether or not I'm charging enough or whatever. You start with a template for for pole heights, and then work from there, or do you just freehand it right? It's it's all ear. Um, it's all ear. Uh, we do have like um, Phil Jones, Gibson Custom Shop builder, just an amazing Gibson historian and fountain of knowledge in general. Uh, he had a an untouched, you know, vintage Les Paul with humbuckers in his shop at some point, and noticed that the pole pieces were radius in the way that the screws were positions were and stuff, and. You know, I latch on to stuff like that, and, and, and so I'll you know make a point to do that you know, that kind of thing as well. So I do I do spend quite a bit of time. But back to your original question about the new guitars and what we're seeing, it's all playability stuff. Um, you know, it's fretwork is pretty good. You know, you're seeing better fretwork than than uh, most years uh, than you know in the past. Um, it's just all over over uh, you know whether or not the guitar plays the way you would like it to play or the way that your customer would like it to play. Do you think like too high nuts, too low nuts, not, not yes. really too much release? Yes, uh, action high at the bridge or whatever. Um, 
you know, there's just little things like that. Um, and the they usually had a whack pretty as soon as you get them out of the house. Like the main thing from Guitar Center is every every time a good customer would like come up with a guitar, I would try to like sneak in and take a look at it and make sure to even just do a quick adjustment and introduce myself. But ne next one rarely, like, especially on, on like lower end production models, there's always like a little bit of relief or sometimes a little bit of bow. Maybe, yeah. Do you well, think it left the factory that way or are you seeing that kind of stuff really happen just in shipping? It's anybody's guess, man. Some of those things are on a boat for months, you know, yeah. coming over and then, uh, and then guitars that are shipped, you know, they're subject to whatever uh, luggage hold, you know, or uh, shipping, you know, container uh, conditions are. It's so, just kiln dried timber. It's just kiln dried stuff. It's not seasoned for you know, right. for any length of time, and so of course, <clears throat> dimensionally, it's not stable to begin with. Right. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's always interesting, you know, when like a lot of customers are concerned about uh, what your warehouse conditions are for wood. Um, you know, like what, what are they stored in? Where are they, you know, whatever. Um, but a lot of times, once you get that out, once they're once they leave the building and you know yep. sit in a hot UPS truck all day long, and then they're sitting in a you know a, a cargo jet and up you know way up in the clouds or whatever, they're subjected to a lot of different things as they're, as they're going through. So it's 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 a crapshoot really what you're what you're going to see. And, and chances are they may not have left the factory that way. Um, Especially with you know, your hire and stuff, but it's not it's not a question. It? How, how are you saying? You know, kind of back to the, the idea of the pickup heights. How are you seeing our manufacturers doing a good job of getting that adjusted, or is that terrible right out of the gate? Um, well, you know, Fender, Squire, and all that kind of stuff. They have a set. You know, if you go to their website, they have their set of specs on the website. They pretty much follow that. Okay. I mean, occasionally, you know. I mean, I'm sure some employees have a bad day or don't give, you know, don't care or whatever, and, and you'll have that. But by and large, they're they're dialed in, you know, to to what the factory specs, many of which were determined in the 50s or whatever, you know. So um, it's. What do you guys like to maintain in your shops for temperature and humidity? Uh, 70 degrees, 70 degrees around there, um, 45 to 50 percent, if possible. Okay. Um, when I had that 7,500 square foot shop, it was impossible. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, even with every humidifier in the world going in that place in the winter time, it was hard to get it above 35 um, percent. And then in the winter time, it gets you know super cold out there as well. Yeah. Um, that building, you know, and certain like there in the winter time to protect the instruments that we needed, you know, protection for, we would hang plastic like make a plastic yeah. room, and we had a case room in the back, you know, we would hum humidify that and leave a light on or whatever to, to for the warmth and then that. Yeah. And then that. So we, we tried to achieve that, um, uh, but it's, you know, it really depends on the facility if, if it can support that or not. Um, you know, my shop, when I was, when I had my shop in my garage, even though it was totally sealed off and very well insulated and stuff like that, it was, it would, fluctuate pretty extreme, so I had humidifiers and dehumidifiers and that kind of stuff. My current shop is, is much more stable than any, any uh, facility I've ever had, and so um, it's it's not always perfect, but it's it's within you know, five yeah. uh, either direction or whatever. But that is definitely something, you know, important, especially if you're working on a lot of acoustic instruments, of course, because the, the uh, Repercussions of bad humidity and you know, yeah. horrible. Um, Dan just restored a 42 Gibson LG2 for me, and uh, it's my own personal instrument. And I'm I'm not an acoustic guy at all, but this one kind of fell on my mind. Yeah. But you know, I'm super super paranoid about it. Now. Having that instrument in the house, I'm just like, oh god, you know, <laughs> it's, gonna, it's gotta be perfect. <laughs> oh, what, that's cool. what about getting instruments in the shop? A lot of people want to get stuff in and get it back out. Do you like to let it climatize for a few days? Or definitely. You um, can? Yeah. yeah, definitely. You want to let it acclimate a little bit um, for a you know for several reasons, but it's it's uh, it's always a good thing. I'll like uh, Sweetwater, for instance. Um, <coughs> what they say, four to eight hours. They get all the guitars coming in off the trucks, <coughs> and then they have you know their their whole warehouse is hundred thousand square feet, totally yeah. compliant controlled. Um, they let them sit for four to eight hours before they even open the cases. No. Um, four to eight. Not four, four. Yeah, four to eight hours, depending on what their day, their workload is for the day. So yeah. they have a designated area where they just stack 
piles of guitars in the boxes, <coughs> and then um, and then they un they take them out of the boxes, let the cases sit for a while. Sweetwater's warehouse is all climate controlled. Totally, the whole thing. Crazy. I wish other people would do that. Um, it's it's insane. Yeah, it, and it's I can't remember. It's it's a hundred thousand square feet, but the square footage of storage is something in the millions or something because they're so tall. Right. It's like four million or something. It was, it was crazy. It must be thirty foot ceilings. Yeah, at least yeah. Or more. Right. Yeah. So I've got a question for guys. As far as when the guitar gets, so I assume. The majority of you have walk-in customers, not like Dan and Eric, or get a lot of mail-in customers. Is that is that generally the case? A lot of people have walk-in customers. Yeah. Um, whenever you, they pick them up, do you guys just go, "Yep, here it is. Take money, get all the way," or do you leave them? Do you have like an amp in your shop or something that they can oh, test it on yeah. and encourage them to bring stuff? So? Okay. Yeah. I think that's another thing that is uh, as you either as you get to know somebody or you get to know them immediately. Um, in this situation, I have people that are terrified to play in front of somebody. Yeah, sure. And totally. just say, oh yeah, man, let me know how it goes. Mm -hmm. And then another person will be there playing. I'll leave them alone, continue working. Sometimes they'll sing for you. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> if they're Sometimes singing, sing they're a good job. Right? <laughs> but then you just let them tell you whether or not they need an adjustment. Right, yeah. And if they do, then you do it. Right. And if they don't, then yeah, it, it is. All right, let's get in the case because we don't have anything else to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. I, I learned the hard way. Um, like there was one particular, and again, this was in Dan's shop. Uh, we had a particularly problematic R9. It had the truss rod wouldn't adjust and the fingerboard was all out of whack. So we did a total refret, everything on this, and leveled the board, did a lot of work on, to get this guitar playing great. And, we were particularly proud of this guitar, and um, the owner was a you know lawyer guy from Cincinnati, and he drove to Athens to pick it up. He'd never actually uh, seen the guitar; it came to Dan right out of right from the where he purchased it. And we were particularly proud of this one because it had some issues, and uh, they were sorted out, and the guitar played beautifully. And the guy came in to pick it up and and uh, um, play something. He was like. No, that's cool. I'll just yeah. I'll just play it when I get home and, and uh, let you guys know. And we're like, no, no, sit down and play this thing, you know. And it's awesome. And the guy sits down and, and embarrassingly played the most broken version of Crazy Train I'd ever yeah. heard in my life, you know. Yeah. And uh, so I felt bad, like, oh, geez, I should never push that button on this guy because he was clearly like, uh, you know. <laughs> and so I don't want to, you know, make a customer feel bad about their playing ability or so. But um, I would lo I'd love to hear. I love to uh, see the the satisfaction um, yeah. on a, a client's face when when uh, you know it's a, I, it's amazing. I find that some of the greatest guitar players in the world don't know what a good playing instrument is like. You know, they've been playing something totally funky forever, and then when you get something in their hands and really set it up nicely, they're just like, "Wow, I didn't know I didn't know that this could play any better." So I I love that part of it. You know, like. Giving somebody something that they've never experienced and it's theirs, you know, they're just like, yeah. And so if, if you can, I love it. And I also really prefer to have them come up with any problems there before they leave and then rather than go home, get pissed, and then come back and really aggro in the shop, you know, like you have an issue there and, you know, I can say, okay, and I can, I can show them something too so that it doesn't, because I'm always afraid of the mechanic, the crystal mechanic there, that, you know, people think that I'm just calling them up and adding a for, you know, a couple hundred dollar charge. Just cause, like I want to show them, like yeah, you see that? You can see the fret bounce up and down. Oh, okay. Like, and you know, I, that makes uh, one of my favorite things about it is being someone's guy, being mm -hmm. the guy, you know, because uh, yeah, especially when I get people that go, hey, Mark recommended me to you. I'm like, Mark? Uh, yeah, what's going on? But like, you know, a lot of my work grew from, uh, you know, Guitar Center didn't advertise when I was there, so all the people that I got were walk-ins, but a lot of people would. You know, over the course of a couple of years, I'd say, yeah, you know, John and Blake Charles said, what was up? So I drove an hour down here to have you work on my guitar. I was like, whoa, that's crazy. Um, and I love just talking about gear and like talking about everything. So it's, I, I don't mind sitting down with the customer and having them go, wow, it's really, I'm like, yeah, it's because of that. And really building that and being someone's guy, it's just like my favorite part about the papers. Um, and that's what's so cool about a setup to me. It's like you said earlier, it's really a customer building exercise than anything else, you know. Uh, really shows them 
why it's important to have a guitar set up periodically and have it handled by someone who knows what they're what they're doing as opposed to just sitting around with a Alan wrench and hadn't had it. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Is there anything on your list to set up stuff that is different than what I do that you want to mention? Um, aside from the fact that I mean we're you know obviously this was from a retail standpoint I had a bunch of rules that I had to follow from Guitar Center. Um, I was really adamant about checking things with the customer, um, which again you can't always do. But um, you know, if in, a, in the same way, if I noticed something, I would explain it to them so it made sense. So they didn't just it wasn't some like goofy or wizard thing where I was like the frets are bad, you owe me four hundred dollars. I'm like what? What happened? I like and very much the same thing. If, if I knew there was a budget issue, I might say, look, here's what we got going on. It's going to cost this much. I can maybe like put it off for a little bit. We can raise the action to stop that from happening. But that's something you need to look forward to. Right. Um, you know, so at least that that number's in their mind or that thing is in their mind and they're thinking about it. But um, I'm like, you know, I had a guy I had a real bad experience where, uh, you know, I looked over an instrument with a guy and uh, I had just started working at Guitar Center. I didn't know we had to sign out a form for the person that says everything's okay. And he like just took me to the mat about it. Like blowing us up on Facebook and, and threatening legal action and everything, which I mean, he, you know. But we ended up helping him out. But after that, I was really strenuous with like looking around and pointing out scratches and like you know checking the neck and, and you know playing every position and stuff and pointing stuff out, um, uh, making sure serial numbers were there, you know, making sure that the serial number stickers weren't taken off or like a serial number wasn't like scratched out or something. Obviously. Sure. Um, would you guys work on guitars like express out serial numbers? Did it matter? If we, if uh, I preferred not to, there yeah. was not a because I, you know, it could have been some guy that bought it, you know, second hand off of a Right, right, right. right. Um, and we log all the serial numbers too, so that we can keep track of, of that sort of thing. Uh, but you know, but um, certainly would never buy a guitar without a serial number. But working on it was kind of like, yeah, and like. That was another bad thing about working at Guitar Center. A lot of people would bring in fake guitars, like fake Gibsons and fake Martins, and you're kind of like obliged to tell them that the guitar is a fake at that point. Right. You know what I mean? So yeah. you're like, hey, this, you spent three grand on not a Taylor 814. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. That can go any number of ways. Oh, yeah. First time I got a stolen guitar in the shop, I was, it was a, a <coughs> 70 Stratocaster, so the serial number was on the pay head, I think. Seems to make sense. And uh, somebody had just removed one of the numbers. Right. And I got super paranoid about it because it was, you know, I was like, geez, this thing has clearly been stolen. I wonder what, you know. And I talked to, at that guitar shop I was working at, at that time was a Roadworthy Guitar and Amp. It's in Bloomington, Indiana. It's actually, it's gone now. Um, but uh, we had a clientele that was pretty police heavy. <laughs> and and uh, right around the time I was looking at this guitar, the guy came in and I was like, you know, what do you do about something like this? This, this guitar's clearly been, you know, altered to, you know, change the serial number, probably stolen, and he's like, well, that number is somewhere between zero and nine, could be any one of those numbers, there's no way you're ever going to know what that number is, there's like, he's like, there's nothing that we can possibly do about it or whatever, so I stopped kind of worrying about that kind of thing, whether or not, you know, something might be sketchy or hot or whatever, so. Right, and I've had customers that knew, he's like, oh, that's, I know it's not really Gibson, I've known that for years, I just like the way you know, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, that's I've experienced that as well. Definitely. Um, I'm pretty rough with. No, I shouldn't should say rough, but I'm pretty. I'll always check the solder joints and give them the, the good old tug test mm -hmm. in front of the customer too, because it's like you know you'll just like open up a guitar and oh there you go you see that like I shouldn't be able to do that and then show them on the other joints. You were telling me that at Benedetto they just like that's what rough. I yeah. rewired like we joke and call it black. Hollow body Mayfair Deluxe. And I rewired it, and Rodrigo took one of the solder aids, and he went straight to the joint with a flat, like, you know, the quarter inch blade or whatever, and, like cranked it over. And he's like, that's what they do at Benedetto. Yep. He's like, if, you're, if your wiring breaks from this, you need to redo it. And I was like, that's a good test, I guess. Did it like, break? No. Right that on. Was awesome. Yeah, man. <laughs> That was, that was another thing too, electronics. Uh, I can't tell you how many, um, won't say the manufacturer's name, but you would grab a push pull pot and like, we'd pull these guitars out of the box and they would always go through me because I would just, and like the, the shaft itself would pop right out. I was like, cool, take it back. Like, and I'd 
Gosh, man. Uh, so, you know, I would always test electronics and uh, make sure that um, everything's fine, everything looks good in there. Um, other than that, pretty standard stuff, like, you know, check the neck with a notch straight edge, uh, talk about them with their action. Uh, I really try to, like you said, gauge the customer. I usually like to have them play in front of me so I can tell if they're like a really light player, if they're really going to dig into it. And if they're not, I just kind of do the overall standard setup, you know, or try to make it better than what they're used to. Um, and I want customers to do it, but a lot of times they won't, at least from my perspective. They'll, they'll just go, yeah, it's better than I had. Thanks, man. And they'll you know, leave. But, um, so I, on that universe, don't spend a whole lot of time working with the pickups unless the customer is like, really attuned to that. Uh, I might make adjustments to the, the same volume if they weren't, or like maybe it sounds a little bit better if I know he's like a, a metal head and like he plugged in, and, you know, I might put him up a little bit closer if I know he can get away with it so he gets more output out of it, but, um, you know, uh, it, 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 I guess I would gauge by the player how much time I'd spend in really detail and stuff, and especially when you bring it up and pick it back up and they're really, you know, digging in about the fine points, like, Gosh, I remember this, this dude that I worked with came in and uh, he was like, yeah, my guitar's like, the neck's not really straight on anymore. And I could tell. It's like, okay, cool. And I look at it with a nostril and there's like no relief in it at all. I was like, this is minimal, dude. There's no way you feel this. He's like, I do, I swear. So I put new strings on it, didn't adjust the neck at all. It just like, and it was like just the same as it was. And I brought it back to him. He goes, I still feel it. And I was like, no, dude, I, I adjusted it. I just wanted to see what he said. He goes, no, dude, you're lying in my face. Like, you didn't adjust that. I know you did not. Thanks. So I took it back and adjusted it. He was like, "All right, perfect." Like, and I like it blew me away. I was like, I didn't think he could feel. It was must have been like, it was a killer neck, but it must have been like probably three thousandths or like two thousandths of the neck relief. But he could feel it, and it, like you know, he's one of those like jazz sure. nerds. Yeah. So his ear was like the most challenging thing for me because he would like he would really hear if the intonation wasn't right on. And I was yeah. Like, All right, man. So I. Have to take it back and stuff. There's some players like that. You know, Nick Zuban. Yeah. He's in that uh, Pink Floyd cover band that plays in Athens every now and then. You see the capacitor guy? <laughs> He's a capacitor guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he brought a, a Strat in that had a, you know, a 0.02 tuner. <clears throat> and uh, Gene took a look at that and was like, oh, it's got the wrong cap in there. And changed it to the typical Fender, you know, value. <clears throat> and uh, when he gave it back to the guy, the guy was just totally freaked out by it. The difference was so much in his ears that uh, he ended up, uh, Gene had to go back in the guitar and trade the thing back out. Yeah. But it was on 10 that he noticed it, right? Like he yeah. didn't have it, he didn't pull it back and go, oh, this right. is a different wow. yeah, yeah, It was yeah. like <coughs> with it full on. He right, he just went with it on 10, you know, he's like, well, it shouldn't really have anything to do with it. And he's like, well, it does. And they changed it on the spot and it had to change Gene's way of thinking because it, you know, his own ears told him that. <coughs> Um, the charge of the change of the capacitor the first time, you just throw it in and let it put him in the axe. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You can never change the caps on somebody's guitar without talking to them about it. Right. right. That's the biggest mistake. That's, that's, a, yeah. that's a big mistake. I've got weird things, you know, like that. That's one of the things. And then also, um, unless it's problematic, but, you know, whenever I'm making a new nut, I always try to match the spacing of the old nut because I don't want it to feel different, yeah, right? yeah. you know? It's great. Unless it's like hanging off a fingerboard or something weird, you know, I always try to do that. Um, It'll freak people out. And yeah. And you'll yeah, be need for it. You'll have that conversation. Yep. Um, do you guys expect, like, in most cases, do you hear back from the customer, like, oh, this is great, or, you know, when they pick it up, they're like, great. And then do you ever, Feel like do you feel that like no news is good news, or you feel if you haven't heard back from a customer that you want to? Depends on the relationship. Sometimes I'll actually call people. Uh huh. Yeah. Have that work out. Right. You know, if, it's, if it was something that was interesting that I cared, uh, you know, it's something that was interesting. <laughs> right. Uh, I, if I know them well enough, I'll say, well, how that work out? Do you like that? And you know, usually it's yeah. I guess I'm trying to get an attitude away from them. <laughs> you know, but there's a little bit of that, but also it's a way to establish contact with the customer, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a positive, you know, on, on the other hand, like I did a job for a guy just last week, you know, uh, uh, Herb Ellis uh, won uh, 75 type guitars, they're usually wretched. Yeah. And okay, so this guy brought one in, I'd never played one that wasn't bad, and he brought one in, and by God, it was bad. 
and it needed a refret and it needed some other stuff. So I had seen a bunch of those. I'd actually worked for Herb Ellis at one brief moment, shining one brief shining moment in my life. Anyway, so I did this job for the guy and turned the totally transformed the guitar, I turned this like dog into like really a smoke and jazz guitar. Didn't know this guy was a referral from a, a, a known jazz player in the region. Anyway, the guy comes back and I give him the guitar and I say, man, you're gonna be you're gonna be stoked, but this this is like now the best Herb Ellis you've ever touched. And I kind of know that's true. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the cat picked it up and I realized this dude can't play. Oh, <laughs> so he's trying to play it and he's like, oh yeah, and he, oh yeah, now it does this and he played a cowboy chord. Right, right, right. And I was like, oh well. Shucks, you're going to enjoy that. Yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> the, uh, the best way I've found to elicit customer feedback for my work is to actually explain to them how fragile my personality is. <laughs> <laughs> I will be thinking about whether or not they're enjoying this thing until they tell Please me they let are. Me know. Yeah, so, so that actually makes it sort of comical in a way that they will get back to you to let you know how it's right. going. Yeah. I use um, it's multiple different payment methods, um, and the one that I get the most feedback on is Square, uh -huh. because they literally have it set up for you to leave feedback. Right. Um, it's in the email receipt, so I always, on a Square payment, I, I say, what's your email address? I stop saying, would you like a receipt? I say, what's your email address? And that's the place that I get the most feedback. When I don't hear from somebody, I just have to treat it as right. job well done. Yeah. yeah. But with uh, QuickBooks, I'm sorry, with it. They didn't stop hanging on the check. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Hey, Eric, I um, apologize for coming in late. Might have already covered it. So when you're doing your initial setups and your uh, um, trust rod and, and leveling, et cetera, do you do your final checks flat on intonation, or do you do it playing position? Oh, playing position always. Okay. Yeah, always. Thank you. It's yep. just, uh, you know, that's, that's the way you're playing it. Larry mentioned that in his okay. first time. Like, you're not playing it like this, you're not playing it on your back, or most people aren't playing it on their back. So this also <laughs> the name should have played with his feet one time. It's really bizarre. Um, but uh, yeah, just in the playing position. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, last year, it was probably right about a year ago, I did a um, uh, replace the fingerboard and on a Travis Bean for a pro player. And I haven't heard a peep out of that guy since, and it makes me worried like, oh man. Because those things are such a, you know, mixed bag anyway from guitar to guitar. But, uh, I feel like getting a hold of them. I gotta know. <laughs> it sucks. Just, just call him. Just call him, man. Yeah, yeah. Swallow your pride. Call him. I'm gonna have to, yeah. I just, I just, Unless it's been over a year, then you're okay. Yeah, no, it's close. <laughs> if it sucks really bad, you probably would have worked. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Right, yeah. Okay, sure that. That. You're talking about some people may not understand they have a good setup. Um, I make a 25 inch scale guitar, and uh, I've had great feedback on how it plays. I like how it plays. I've got one virtuoso rock player, though who loves it but comments that it always still feels spongy no matter what I do. Is that a factor if I just need to make a 25 and a half inch scale guitar for this guy? Um, there's a few things that, that there's a few things that are coming into play there. I mean it could be neck angle, um, hardware choices. Uh, so by spongy like too bendy to Plays a lot of tapping and harmonics and, uh -huh. and up at the higher registers. He just it, you want, it feels like there's a little too much play for him. He wants a 25 and a half. Yeah, he wants for sure. I that. play a lot of tappy stuff, like math rock stuff, and it's, it's almost everyone exclusively plays 25 and a half. Interesting. Yeah, I, I don't think well, there's like, a way. Tellies I, are like, yeah. it's so weird to say. <laughs> like, would, I like like 90s emo, and everyone plays tellies. It's all. Just telly, just yeah. Telly's with a fender amp and yeah. a little bit of compression sometimes, but you don't. Do you think it. that um, on a twenty-five inch scale, like, is it a string through body? Or? It's a, it's actually a, a headless type model. Oh, no, that's it. That's that's yeah. You he wants the length because the headless models have less string tension. Right. right. There's, there's no. But could you, that makes sense. Could you increase the string length on a shorter scale and kind of get the same thing? I mean, uh, the yeah, the string length. 
Um, you mean where it anchors? Yeah. Yeah, I'll oh. back the mechanism right. that's affixing the strings. Right. Yeah. So almost like a tailpiece. Right. Let's think. Yeah. Give it a little more. Yeah. 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 Or like a Kubiki, which had an extension headstock that didn't have tuners on it, that the strings anchored in, and then the tuners. That's, that's essentially what I did. Yeah, so I got a headstock yeah. where it's anchored. Um, yeah, remember those Kubiki abstractor days? Totally. So had the big wheel tuners on the right. bottom, but yeah. had the headstocks to him. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so what I'm hearing is probably 25 and a half. Days. Very well, Mike. It oh, seems that way, not, especially yeah. with the, the headless There's a lot of things. I mean, I, you could go, you could suggest a thicker string gauge, but I like to do stupid stuff. Like, I have 13s on my telly, and I love it, so. Probably sounds fantastic. It sounds awesome. Yeah. It sounds so good. Big strings, big telly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> big strings, play it hard. That's, yeah. I, plain, plain G or wrapped G? Plain. A wrapped, yeah, for sure. Yeah, the telly in the student Mac phone room's got 12s on it. Yeah. Just, 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 it's a way of it. It rules. It's, it's honestly yeah. awesome. Yeah. Like, it yeah. sounds so counterintuitive, counter but yeah. I really like it. But then I played a Mustang recently for the first time. Mm -hmm. My hands are fat fingered, so I didn't think I'd like the short the short CL, but it had like, must have had 9s or 10s on it, but I, it was same. It was really similar tension. Yeah. I was like, this rules too. Yeah. It's it's a one of the you know a lot of um, a lot of players that I deal with are very particular about scale length and neck size and, and stuff like that. Um, I uh, I own probably 50 guitars and I find it pretty easy to move in between those things and not worry about those kind of things. There's only one guitar that has ever bugged me on that, and it was. Um, uh, 1970 Dan Armstrong Lucite, you know, one of those Lucite amp guitars. It had this, like a neck that was smaller than an Ibanez Wizard on it, and that thing just freaked me out. And it was almost as wide at the nut, at the, you know, the end of the fingerboard as it was at the nut, and that thing just drove me crazy. And I miss it, I wish I wouldn't have traded it off for something else, but it was something that, yeah, it was something that really was a drag to, to uh, mess with. Um, to switch to, especially if you're like playing one guitar, break a string, and you go to that one, and you're like, ah, God. <laughs> so it's, it's a different kind of thing. Um, both these guitars are yeah. stuff that Aaron and I have messed with. If you want to come up and play any of these, feel free to. If you have any other questions, feel free to. All these, uh, let's say, clean and polished guitars, you guys got a go to product that works all the time? Um, well, of course, we're real fond of the Stuart McDonald Preservation Polish. That stuff is really great. Um, the downside is it is it can't be shipped overseas because it is flammable, but not bad. I mean, it's not like you know the fumes are going to light up or whatever. Um, uh, but it's it is got a, a flammable component in it. But um, I'm a fan of the Music Nomad stuff. I like their detailer a lot. Um, the Dario products which we have on the bench right now. I'm not I'm not opposed. To, I'm, I kind of. I kind of I'd like to try everything a little bit and just to see what it is. So I'd are say. Are they or are they just polishes? What's that? Are they compounds at all? No, most of the. I mean, it, well, some of you can buy some with, with uh, abrasives in them, but the ones I'm talking about right now, there's no you know no notable abrasives in them. Um, actually, my favorite is uh, uh, for just cleaning is um, Novus Number no. One. Have you ever seen that Novus plastic polish? Ah, uh, sure. Uh, Novus Number no. One, and then for yeah, it's a pump spray, and then the. Uh, Novus number two is amazing for you know polishing. It's got some abrasive in it. It's a the base of the product is a diatomaceous earth, so it's like ground up seashells and whatnot. Um, that is my all-time favorite polish for removing scratches and you know finished punches and stuff like that. That that stuff is fantastic. Uh, and so yeah, between Novus one and two, that's my polish, my abrasive polish, and my cleaner. They do make an abrasive of uh, uh, Novus number three, which is a heavier abrasive, um, which is also which is also a, a good deal, you know, to, you know, for more roughed up finishes and stuff like that. So that would be my go-to, my go-to stuff. But I do like for just cleaning. I love the Music Nomad guitar detail. I like that a lot. It smells a little funky, a little sweet, but it's uh, it does a really good job. And then uh, for 
you know, that'll be like the last step I'll do before I put it in the case to wipe off fingerprints and smudges and all that kind of stuff. But then for polishing a guitar when I have the strings off is, um, you know, a non-abrasive uh, preservation polish. So I'm all over the board there. <laughs> what do you like to do on fingerboards? What's that? I really like the, uh, if it's the, the uh, Music Nomad makes it an F1 oil, sure they call it. The bottle's kind of messy, but I really like it more than anything else. Um, I really like the, uh, not the lemon oil that we carry, but the fretboard finishing oil because it dries like a heart. Yeah, I've been using that a lot. I really did that. Really. Um, that's me on the other hand, I don't like that at all. So you don't like it? Yeah. It's just difference, differences in opinions. I don't want to put a hard finish on the fingerboard, but right. You know, I know millions of dudes. That guy right there. What? The, the fretboard finishing line. Oh my gosh, it's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I love that stuff. I use it all yeah. the time. Yeah. yeah but yeah. Uh, I love the music known at the detailer too. That's my favorite yeah. stuff. And the, the Dario Shine. Right. I like too. Yeah. yeah. Does anyone What's else it? spray themselves in the face with that pump bottle though? No, that would suck. Uh, <laughs> the top like, doesn't have enough of an indent on it, so if I'm not paying attention all the right. stuff. <laughs> Yeah, that's no good. More than once, I have to glasses. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a whole bunch, folks. And if you have any questions, you want to come and look at any of the junk we have up here? Thanks, buddy. No.